you all very much indeed for uh, joining us today. Um, I see we have uh, people following this from a number of uh, different European countries and uh, also the UK. I'm not sure whether we call uh, the UK uh, a European country these days or not. Um, and we uh, also, I believe, may have some, one or two people up very early in the US too. So welcome uh, to you all. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Osborne. I am the CEO uh, of IFI Global, which is a research and uh, uh, media house based in the, the city of London. Um, one of our four publications, The Tracker, has been following uh, Manco's ever since AIFMD came on the scene, which was uh, several years ago now. Uh, and The Tracker is just about to publish its seventh annual uh, Manco Guide uh, for Managers. And this year, uh, there will be a lot of information in there uh, for U.S. managers, as we have recently launched a publication for U.S. alternative managers looking to come either to Europe or to go offshore. Um, I'm going to give a very short scene setting uh, presentation, and then we are going to get into uh, the panel discussion. Uh, please do ask questions. As we go along, we are using the Q&A bottom at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will likely take one or two of those questions as we go along, but we will uh, also, if we get a number of them, uh, save a few minutes uh, for questions at the end. Right, now, every time I do this on my new computer, there's a minor delay as I get onto the first slide, and it's happening again, but it always gets there. Hopefully it will do that this time too. Thanks. Ah, it is fantastic. It takes why I don't know a couple of minutes to kick into life. So uh, joining me today, um, we have Peter Cripwell, who is the CEO of a risk system, who are based in Dublin. Risk system um, is used by a lot of mancos in both uh, Dublin and Luxembourg. We have Cyril Delamere, who's the chief growth officer of Waystone, and doubtless many of you know, Waystone is a recently merged entity of Montlake, MDO, and DMS. And we have Timothy Fuchs, who's the CEO of Fuchs Asset Management, uh, which is based in Luxembourg. Uh, Fuchs is both a wealth manager and also a third party manco. And we have uh, Luke Spencer Wilson, who's the head of relationship management at C3 Post Trade. C3 Post Trade is a back office operating system catering for Mancos, hedge funds, and other fund managers. They work with a number of Mancos in Dublin and Luxembourg. So I thought I would start out. Um, so I believe when we're talking about Mancos, we're a part of a very relatively long evolutionary journey. Potentially, we're halfway through that evolution. Who knows? But let's go back to where they, uh, where the whole thing began. It began in Luxembourg back in the early to mid 1990s when U63 came in, until AIFMD, it really was something that was only used by um, uh, U6 fund managers. Um, and in the early days after the AFM directive came in, um, it was not necessarily much of a big deal. Uh, the Central Bank of Ireland, the CSSF, weren't too fussed about uh, these manco, these third party mancos, or indeed the, the, the single standalone mancos that were based and developing in their jurisdictions. It was relatively light oversight, uh, no particular big deal. The big change uh, came, and this comes on to the fourth item on this, on this uh, slide here, came with an event that took place in June 2016, when we British decided to exit the European Union, which um, is turning out to be a multi-year process with regulatory divergence between uh, the UK and the EU still to come. I think we're still in the very early stages of that. And um, Mancos have taken on a whole new lease of life in uh, Ireland and in Luxembourg as a result. And there is much more regulatory scrutiny uh, of their activities uh, by the regulators there, and doubtless that will continue. We'll be getting into that discussion a bit later. So the future. Uh, one of the questions I'll be asking the panel in a few minutes is, will distribution and portfolio management oversight uh, be added to um, the uh, current functions that 
uh, mancos uh, have to perform in the jurisdiction where the fund is domiciled. And uh, as we discussed in our prep call the other day, in a way, mancos are morphing from being what they effectively once were, which were sort of service providers uh, performing effectively a regulatory function um, in, in these jurisdictions where, where, the, where the funds were domiciled into something much more like partners. Um, uh, this is a whole new creation that's happening because it's a relatively slow and evolution, evolutionary process. It's probably not noticed in the same way, but it is uniquely a European thing. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, which brings me to the final point on this slide. For investors, any investor in any fund, probably anywhere in the world, the reason you're in that fund is for the performance. What matters to you are the portfolio management team, wherever they may be based, whether it's in London, New York, Timbuktu, Tokyo, whatever it may be. But for the regulators, what matters is not necessarily so much that portfolio management team at all. It is the functioning of the Manco. And that takes place particularly in Dublin and Luxembourg. And one of the questions I'm going to be trying to tease out with the panel today is, is that dichotomy, if that's what it is, healthy? Uh, is it really a, um, a good idea to look at the portfolio manager as really being not an awful lot more than, than another service provider to the fund, like the custodian or the fund administrator, which is where, in a sense, in, in part, uh, this is going. I'm sure some of the panelists might pick me up on that in a minute. So quickly, Manco Growth. Um, uh, the tracker, I believe, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the only publication that really follows and specializes on the subject of Mancos in the way that we do. We regularly uh, go through uh, and contact uh, uh, all the Mancos that we, we know of in particularly Dublin and Luxembourg to get information off them. And the last time we did it was September. We're preparing our annual Manco guide, I mentioned right now, which will be out shortly. But back in September, um, the, of the 12 that we had information back from, the total AUM was 673 billion. These are just third party Mancos, not the standalone uh, single Mancos. Uh, one of those reported um, uh, a 90% increase in assets and a 27% increase in managers over their period from very late last year until September this year. Two Mancos reported pretty much identical 25% increases in assets, uh, one with a 5% increase in managers and the other with a 20% increase in managers. And then the average increase in assets of those reporting, and that's very important because several decided not to get back uh, to us, which probably means they didn't have anything particularly exciting to say. But nonetheless, of those that got back to us, the average increase in assets over the uh, period from late last year until this autumn was in a remarkable 23%, and that's a record. So th in this business, in one sense, is really booming. Uh, it's really growing quickly at the moment, but so is the industry. So that's probably what you would expect. Um, I quickly want to mention, um, because we we are first and foremost uh, a research house rather than a media firm, even though we've got uh, four very specialist publications. And um, uh, when we launched our publication for the US market called FSA, FSI, stands for Fund Structuring International, we did some uh, research on uh, um, fund structuring with US managers based in the US. And um, to our surprise, to a certain extent, I'll be honest, um, uh, there was a much greater recognition of what mancos were amongst those we surveyed than had been the case in the past. Of course, all the lawyers we also surveyed any international lawyer, of course, for many years has known all about Mancos, but the managers themselves, not necessarily. I think part of the reason for that was because we were very lucky. We've been working with a fantastic fir regulatory firm in the States that um, advises managers on a whole host of regulatory issues when they go abroad. So that may have helped boost the sample in terms of recognition. But nonetheless, 47% of managers across the US who we surveyed were aware at least of what a Manco is, and that's much higher than it's been in the past. Questions I'm gonna to put to the panel today. Um, uh, coming back to the question of regulatory scrutiny, I think you know, we're, we're on an upward or a downward path, depending on your point of view, of increasing scrutiny post-Brexit. And I think as regulatory divergence 
uh, develops uh, between London or between the UK and the rest of Europe, um, that scrutiny is only going to get um, stronger. Next year, we have the many joys of the SFDR, the level two coming in, which the UK is not going to be um, uh, signing up for. But of course, if you have a, if you're a UK manager distributing in Europe, you're going to have to be compliant with that. But that, I presume, will be done a lot by the mancos in the jurisdiction where the fund is domiciled. Um, uh, I'm very pleased we have a risk specialist on the panel because one of the innovations of uh, the European model of fund management is that risk is now done in the jurisdiction where a fund is domiciled. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? And are we going to get something similar happening uh, in terms of portfolio management? Outsourcing versus in-house, which is the better model? You can take that from two different directions. Should you be a manco? Should you be developing all your technology yourself? Should you be buying the, uh, the best of breed technology coming in or, uh, or indeed risk or whatever it may be? Should you be using uh, a third party administrator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or should you be using your own? And equally, you can say outsourcing versus in-house. Should you be, if you've got whatever it may be, four or five or six uh, billion euros under management, should you be outsourcing to being on a third party uh, manco or should you be um, doing it yourself? What is the cutoff point? Um, there is, as I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you, there's been the most extraordinary private equity boom affecting many different sectors of society, particularly the finance and the alternative finance industry. Then there's a lot of uh, PE money that's come pouring into the manco sector um, and it is changing. I hear this a lot. A lot of the stuff I hear is off the record and unpublishable, um, but nonetheless, it is changing. It's the Manco business. And one of the things I want to talk about today is how is that changing the Manco business? And um, finally, what uh, was, as I said earlier, an outsourced compliance function is turning into something very different. What will it become if we were here five years in the future? What would be different about Mancos then? than um, uh, uh, back in the early days when they first got started on the alternative side of the business post AI FMD coming in. Finally, um, before we get into the panel, um, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, tell you what we've got coming up uh, and we have, um, uh, I will continue to, to have the tracker doing all it, it does now uh, in terms of Manco development. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, it remains the only publication that does that the whole time. Uh, we also um, uh, will continue to uh, publish the annual guide, but we now have this US publication. And as a result of that, um, uh, we will be covering Mancos for the US market in a slightly different way for, for US managers looking to come to Europe. And we've launched alongside um, the uh, uh, FSI, we have launched um, selection Intelligence Service, that's what SIS stands for, which is advice on manker selection for US managers, but also um, on uh, selection of fund directors uh, for their boards, fund jurisdictional choice, and service providers with an ESG um, um, uh, angle. So uh, uh, that's, that's what's coming up from us. So let me now stop uh, uh, sharing scre screen and bring the panel up. Hooray, there they all are. You have a slight worry with Cyril, but he's there, and he's actually there with his own name, which is quite remarkable. Uh, before we get into uh, some of the uh, questions, gentlemen, um, I wanted to ask you for any reaction you have to um, the comments that I've uh, just been making. Um, oh, actually, I'd, I'd actually uh, query your timeline, Simon. I think, to be honest, the light regulation was pre-2008. And I think basically, you know, every, everything was fairly easy then. After that, I think that's when st things started getting messy. I remember being at a Khan conference in London where many participants were, well, complaining about the tsunami of regulations. And they were firmly put in place by a regulator who said, it's not a tsunami of regulations. 2008, 2011 happened and we're reacting to it. And I think it's not Brexit. It's, that's correlation is not causation. I would say it's purely the fact that it takes quite a while for the super tankers of politics and regulatory to get their 
ducks in order. And you, it's been slow, but it's coming. And it's basically a case of, you know, every time you look at the regulators again, you see them getting, they've got better people with more time on their hands to look deeper and deeper into what's going on. It's not that it was lacking in 2013. It was just they hadn't got the people, the resources or the legislation. They have it now. They're going to use it. And one of the things we talked about, uh, then the first question that we uh, I had in, in, in the email I sent you was uh, how much more regulation, uh, because Cyril, I think you made the point that that's really been driving a lot of what's been going on in the industry. I think that was one of your comments on, on the prep call. Yeah, um, I, I think in, in some ways, if you look at the evolution of the other Manco uh, business and agree with Peter, uh, you know, Brexit has nothing really to do. I think there's a that we, we can come to that a bit later, but there's been enhancements done because, because of uh, or alongside a Brexit kind of scenario. But in reality, what has happened over the last the last 10 years or so, it's been a a, a the add-on of a new provider to the funds ecosystem and basically adding the, the management company business to the ecosystem through the regulators they have basically looked at a local kind of sponsor for the funds where the management company today is becoming really the center of the fund oversight with the appointment of the administrator, the custodians, the the auditors, and very and and, and to a certain extent the, uh, the the investment manager, and 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 very much kind of you know acting as the um, as, as as the the oversight for this ecosystem, making sure it works well, making sure that fund structures are are, are keeping themselves in line with the the rules and regulation, and and and, and very much kind of you know that has not come. In, in just one day, it was an evolution of, you know, one obligation after another coming and, and, and being put upon the Manco, which saw its remit kind of evolve and grow over the years, as well as, you know, what we see in the future, which is kind of a, a some further uh, initiatives that uh, the the management company will be expected to, uh, to, to, to look at, you know, namely, the cross-border uh, distribution, the marketing activities, all the way down to digital marketing, and uh, and and very much be kind of a, a an active oversight on funds to make sure that investors are investing in the product that is what is written in the supplement, and um, and is 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 basically they are they are treated in, in the best way possible. Before we get on to um, other subjects, does anybody else want to say anything about the regulatory developments um, in terms of where you expect this to go? As I mentioned a second ago, uh, next year, unless it gets postponed again, which I think is a, a realistic possibility, we have the many joys of uh, the level two SFDR coming in, which is going to cause probably um, uh, a lot of nightmares for a lot of people, especially the Mancos. Uh, and uh, Peter, you also, you, I know you cover um, uh, SFDR very closely. What do you think will happen when that comes in? And in, in, in terms um, of general, well, uh, well, overall, I hate to say it, but I think SFDR is causing nightmares for Mancos as we speak. Um, the recent letters from both the CSSF and the CBI giving uh, managers the lucky access to um, accelerated regulation on Article 8 funds, um, the increased need to actually determine what's actually makes up an, an Article 8 fund. I think one of the interesting uh, developments is that what people thought was an Article 8 fund sort of six, nine months ago probably is not an Article 8 fund anymore. There's clearly a lot more concern about greenwashing. There's clearly a lot more concern. Um, if you look at the um, letter from the F FCA, they care about um, whether or not if you have sustainable in your name, does that make you totally sustainable or is it merely just another thing? It looks like you mentioned ESG, you've got to be very ESG. All of these things, even before SFDR comes in, is going to uh, cause, I think, a lot of managers to have a lot of issues because the reality is there isn't a uniform, you know, reporting or um, 
as it were, standard. I mean, they sort of give very broad brush strokes, and now we've got to try and fit in it. And we've got to try and fit in it without having the taxonomy data that we need to actually fill in all of the pretty little templates that have been given us. Um, I think over the next six months, irrespective of its, um, irrespective of its delay or otherwise, we're going to have a lot more people looking a lot more deeply into exactly what's going on here. There are clearly massive advantages to being an Article 8 fund. Um, but, you know, nobody wants to go from an Article 8 to an Article 6 because there would be dragons. That would be a disaster on legs. So you need to be very careful now about what you're saying, about what you're going to do in the future. Okay, let's, let's move on to um, other areas. Uh, Timothy, can I come to you on the whole question of um, the possibility of portfolio, more, por more portfolio management activity taking place in uh, of, uh, the jurisdiction where the fund is domiciled and uh, uh, has taken place in the past. Obviously, as I said in the introduction, you've got to do risk in the jurisdiction where the fund is domiciled. Do you think that's likely to happen? Uh, uh, and are the Mancos equipped for that? Should, it, should that be the case? Well, I think to make the link um, between your question and what uh, Peter and Cyril have just said, we've come since 2008 crisis through a long process of increasing regulation and oversight of uh, the financial players and especially on the Mancos. I think from what I see that the uh, Manco is becoming a real business and not only a tick the box service provider, it is becoming how I see it as a partnership between a portfolio manager and a organization that is able to make a fund, a structure efficient and compliant with its regulation. 10, maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago, it was easier to manage the structure, being the fund, and generate performance and manage the investors' relation marketing function. Today, it's becoming nearly impossible if you're not a big organization to have everything under one roof because what you mentioned before is really important. Why do people subscribe to a fund? because it generates performance and because the strategy fits to what investors are looking for. And that is the first reason why they invest. And this is the first reason why they stay. But above all that, you need to have a structure that is operationally efficient, that is compliant with all the regulation that we're having. And we're probably not going in the coming years through a process of uh, less regulation. We talked about SFDR, um, we talked about cross-border distribution, and that's probably continue over, uh, the, over the future. So the Manco has the need to be well-organized. The Manco has the need to have competencies. The Manco has, has to have people and the Manco has to have systems. What I see is our two business models that can differentiate one to another, and that probably um, will require more or less uh, competencies, capacities within the organization. The one is the Manco takes care, takes care about the risk and all the tasks linked to the governance of the fund being compliance, valuation, uh, oversight of the, of the delegates, et cetera, uh, and delegates to portfolio management. This is something that we see for bigger clients being already uh, well-structured, having already a certain size of uh, assets where they are themselves regulated somewhere. Usually the rule for Luxembourg uh, is that uh, the delegated portfolio manager uh, has to be regulated for such activity in an equivalent country to Luxembourg. So typically uh, what's happening uh, in the UK is that we can still continue to delegate the portfolio management and uh, function to, uh, to an FCA regulated entity. 
And in that case, we keep an oversight of the activity uh, of the portfolio manager, but the portfolio manager has its hands free to deploy his strategy. And in parallel to that has the, unfortunately, regulatory burden of its own organization and of its own regulator. That is the first thing. And in that, apart from uh, being equipped with the right systems and with the right people at the level of, of the Mancoof to perform the oversight, there is not much more that the Manco can do. On the second side, you have the business where you have the advisory model, where you have entities that are not big enough to become regulated and act as an advisor and will provide the portfolio manager, being in our case here, uh, the Manco, with um, recommendations. But that, and that is a, probably the big difference uh, today compared to a few years ago. A few years ago, you could just receive a sheet with, um, with recommendations. You just have a look on it and you pass them into the market, depending on the type of strategy we're, we're talking about. Today, and I'm talking for Luxembourg, it has become a dedicated activity that requires to have substance at the level of the Manco. We had our 18698 circular uh, three years ago that has imposed that the Manco has its own knowledge internally to be able to not oversight, but to perform the portfolio management function. Let's be clear on the performance of the portfolio management function in a third party Manco model you're not deploying your own strategy and uh, your own knowledge, but you're there to be able to challenge what the investment advisor is providing you as an advice. You have to be able to challenge, but you have also to be able to document. That means that you have to have people on the ground that understand the different strategies that you're managing. That's already a first challenge because private equity is not real estate. Different private equities are not the same. Financial assets are not the same and we can, uh, duplicate the same reflection for uh, the different uh, strategies that you can wrap under uh, a, a fund, but that needs to be covered with competencies at the level of the Manco, and that, to, that needs to be covered with systems on a case-by-case -case basis, depending again on uh, the type of relationship and the type of uh, strategies you're managing. So to answer clearly the question is, um, the Manco has to if it, is to, um, if it is mandated to operate the portfolio management, has to have substance and have to have um, the knowledge in the strategy it is managing to be able to operate the role challenging of the advisors of um, the investment advisor. Thank you. Lou, can I come to you um, and ask you, um, I wanna go on to insourcing versus uh, outsourcing. But um, just before you get into that, uh, any comments you might have on that, um, uh, what do you think about this model we have? Because you know the rest of the world very well, this model across Europe that we have, where we have these portfolio managers uh, surrounding us in London and uh, these regulatory entities in Dublin and Luxembourg and elsewhere. That are, that's what matters to the regulator is what happens in Dublin or Luxembourg, not what's going on so much with the portfolio management teams in Edinburgh, London, New York, or wherever it may be. Uh, and then let's go on to insources versus outsources. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I mean, from, from a standpoint, just probably touch on some of Tim Timothy's points. Um, you know, ha having, having a portfolio manager uh, in, in situ, you know, it's not always just about having the the, the, the technology and, and the right. You know, it, it's whether actually people want to move to the various jurisdictions in the first place as well. You know, do they up, upheave um, families? And, and I think that that that's one point that often gets overlooked that, that there'll be this huge mass migration, but the actual infrastructure supporting the ancillary people around it um, is, is that there in place as well. So you, you've got you've you've got that on a, on a sort of a human element as well. Um, in terms of um, the outsource and insource, um, that that is that is an interesting one from a perspective of what is currently available and what is um, 
you know, what 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 technology is 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 in situ such that you can perform all the functions, and uh, and at what price are you willing to pay um, that it, it's economically viable to then run run the fund? So often in a in a hedge fund environment, you might you know you go through a sort of a, a life cycle journey that you probably start off with with doing as much as you can in house, then moving along the curve. You know, you've got a bit more AUM and a bit more money to be able to uh, source it outside. And then, you know, if you grow some of the uh, outsourcing, um, your provider can't actually provide and there'll be gaps. So you start to bring some of that back in and then you sort of get to an inflection point, but you're fairly big that you might either have a, like a 50-50 model where 50% is outsourced, 50% you're doing, or then you take it all back in, uh, um, you know, further down the line. So... You know, and technology, I think, has been a real enabler, um, as we've seen through the pandemic, you know, um, you know, a lot of cloud based solutions where people can be work from home and, and, and effectively get on and do their job and data is coming, coming to them in their living room or wherever they, they s situate themselves. But easily, there's, you know, I think from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, the regulator would prefer everybody back in the office for where was the controlled environment and where all the data was stored. And then we can go into this whole, um, what does that actually look like from a regulatory perspective with an oversight, you know, how is the data stored? How are people, um, what are they doing with the data? I mean, there's an awful lot of data that is being um, sent around the world. And, you know, US managers don't necessarily want their data to lead to lead the US and and, and, and Europe is the same. Um, it, it leads to a sort of interesting conversation as how and where and what cost um, does the insource versus outsource uh, and what further operational risks does it bring about? Yeah, by the way, we're getting in an amazingly large number of questions. What I think we'll do is rattle through the, our prepared stuff now and then probably save a reasonable amount of time for questions even though we've only still only got 25 minutes to go in total so i'm what in if that works let me come to you cyril and ask something i really would like to get your views on because you've been right in the middle of it at waystone this wall of money if that's the right way of putting it has come into mancos and it wasn't just this year it's been coming in for a while uh, uh do you agree with my uh comment in the introduction that it is potentially changing the business and if so how is it changing the business what observations uh that do you have you ran montlake until when was it at the end of last year beginning of this year when it all merged into waystone with dms and yep. mdo um uh, but there are other examples out there in very in somewhat similar situations <clears throat> to you it's but is it how much is it uh, other than sheer size, uh, how much is it changing the business? So I, I think, you know, private equity uh, money, as, as you mentioned, a wall of money, there is there is a lot of money coming into in, into this into this sector, but it's, it's it's not new. The financial services industry has uh, has seen influx of money in different ways at different point in time. You know the 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 kind of the the one that has gone on for a long time and, and is still going on is is the fund administration uh, business, which has consolidated, been backed by private equity, and today in the in the fund admin business, you really have private equity backed admin or banks. And that's kind of, you know, on a roughly, that's kind of what you have as, as, as the landscape. The, the, on, on the Manco front, I think everything that Tim has been saying, Peter, you know, yourself in the introduction, it's very clear that this business has been a rapidly evolving business that has been kind of, you know, evolving on, on the one side because regulators have implemented new rules, new responsibilities on this very particular kind of uh, structure, which is a management company, as I mentioned earlier, which you know manages the the ecosystem of the fund and is effectively the the local sponsor and the local person responsible for the well-being of these of these regulated products. So, as 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 these different regulatory obligations came into force there was also a, a number of items that came in which is substance 
and and in order to make sure that you know these these regulatory obligations are met and that a lot of the work is actually not done on a ad source basis but is actually done within within the country and, and whether that's in Luxembourg or, or or in Ireland when I think you know going back to your point about risk management we as a management company you know would always expect our delegates investment manager to do obviously to run their investment strategy in the right way and also conduct their own risk management on their portfolio that's that's the basis of when we enter into with, with a manager into into a contract to launch a fund with them where they need to have the appropriate risk controls regulatory regime etc to 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 be able to to run the strategy for for their clients now what has evolved is that initially mancos were there to do an oversight on the risk management and this has evolved i'm sure peter would jump in there at some stage and kind of say we actually have to do as much if not more than than fund managers in very specific items that the regulatory reporting is 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 asking us to do and that's looking at you know var based risk management that's looking at liquidity it's looking at you know appropriate assets within with, within the portfolio especially if it's if it's a usage so if you put everything into the bag suddenly if you actually want to do a good job and grow a scalable business you need you need you need funding uh, where do you find funding these days it's with private equity and and, and regulators i believe have been kind of you know pushing towards the we don't really want too many mid-sized mancos or smaller mancos we'd rather have large mancos or specialist mancos and i think there's there's there's, there's very much kind of uh, you know a a two stream kind of coming in this in the industry is you have the the the, the likes of waystones which are large global governance and compliance uh, firms that oversee multi jurisdictions, and then and 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 that is you know like ourselves, we're we're private equity backed, but you know management is very much kind of you know in the driving seat and large shareholders, and then you have the more kind of like private businesses that will be more local, but will 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 cater to a certain amount of 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 needs that clients may have, including you know the relationship between investment advisor and investment management trading um and, and and very much kind of having a a a more boutique uh offering so it's kind of the where it's coming from and and and, and private equity obviously is uh is, is 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 good to to be able to to grow and uh and continue the continuing the growth path and investing into everything that is needed to make sure that we keep the investors safe, the, we have the appropriate reporting to the managers, and we keep our regulators on side and, uh, and are ready to uh, apprehend any other new regulatory changes and ch and that, that may appear. Peter, do you want to react to some of those comments about Cyril on, on the risk, risk side? And, uh, and, and if you could also add, perhaps, from your observation of, of looking at the business from where you are positioned, how do you think it's evolved and, put, and how, if you were uh, going to put your uh, forecasting cap on, how, where do you think it's going? Um, and then we're going to get, after you answer that, Peter, we're going to get into the lot of questions I'm, uh, we have. So we want to save some time for that. We haven't got a lot of time left. So over to you. Okay, well, I appreciate it's not a panelist, but I'm stealing from a a Andrew White at Fund uh, Fund App, who's saying there's only three three uh, definites in this life: death, taxes, and increased regulation. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's the uh, that's what we're at. But I, I actually I think Cyril's hit the nail completely on the head when it comes to sort of the risk oversight. I, I would stress that risk management is something that should be done by the fund manager. Um, and People who think in Manco so that they're managing the risk of the underlying portfolio need to be a bit nervous if that's what they think they're doing. But I do think it's very important to realize that um, you know, the regulator is putting burdens on a Manco that are far wider and greater than those that the risk manager of a specific sub fund will experience because this, the risk manager has to worry about a narrow rule of things relating to the fund. 
the fun the manco level has got a vast amount of things that they have to care about and they have to be looking at it all the time um it's not good enough to come back and say well you know things are fine at the moment not only do you need to do things you need to evidence you're doing things and if the feds ever come calling you have to provide them with that evidence lickety split so there is in fact a, a vast amount of infrastructure certainly on the risk risk reporting risk monitoring that is now just has to be done um you talk about insourcing and outsourcing now obviously sitting where i am i love the idea of outsourcing but i can understand why firms insource because you know you know we, we're living in a world where data is going to be sometime in the fund management the new oil gold slash Bitcoin. Well, not this week, obviously. Um, but having all of that data integrated is going to be one of the biggest challenge. Um, you need, you know, at the moment, we are, you know, how many spreadsheets do you still see on the desks of various fund managers, bankers, etc. That is a disaster in terms of data management. If you're actually going to start digging into things, you need to actually integrate across vast amounts of systems. So your marketing people can talk to your risk managers, can talk to your compliance, can talk to your portfolio oversight. All of the DP function requires data and requires it to be all pretty much the same sort. Um, so, you know, whilst I love the idea of outsourcing, you can see why in some situations, if you have the skills and ability to design that, and I have to say they are rare and few between, then you can see why it might make sense. Alternatively, there's a lot of bridges. And that's probably one of the greatest horrible things is that people building bridges between systems that really don't want to talk to each other. I mean, we have enough fun trying to get data out of um, administrators, um, different administrators with different file types, et cetera, et cetera. This just gets bigger when you're talking to the marketing, when you're talking to the, um, the portfolio, um, you sort of the performance attribution, when you're talking to the marketing. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we see going forward. Thank you. Right. Now, we haven't got long left. What I'm, I've never done this before. I think I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because we're not going to probably have time to read it answer every single question. I'm going to read the whole lot out and hopefully uh, you guys can pick up, you know, in, if you don't mind keeping your answers very brief, the um, questions, at least most of them that have been asked. So somebody has asked, please explain how the fee structures work. Somebody else has asked, Mancos are based on regulatory reform, not substance, and the fund will continue as a product of the investment manager, not the Manco. Does the Manco appoint the investment manager or is the, invest the investment manager actor who appoints the, the Manco, the admin de depot, the board, etc.? If you need proof, IM fees are 35 to 40 times more than Manco's. Manco, this is probably from a portfolio manager. Manco enable regulators create a made in Europe. Uh, funds are about portfolio management. What, portf what portfolio management do Manco's make? Not sure what that mean, means by that, or she, I should say. Um, what size do you need to be in AUM to have your own Manco as opposed to being on a third party hoster? What is the difference between tick the box and regulatory enablement? For example, all PMs need risk management as part of portfolio management and the Manco provides the local regulatory compliance. Please explain what you mean by a dichotomy between portfolio managers and regulators. Gosh, okay, who wants to? To pick up some of those. We're the rapid fire round. We've got 14 minutes left. Anyone want to comment on any of those things? Then we'll speak at once. So I'll, if you want to do I'll, 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 I'll take the fee structure. Uh, that's the that's the easy one. I like the dichotomy to to Tim. <laughs> um, so in, in, in terms of fee structure, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we, we charge as an industry on basis points, you know, whether that's a, a fund admin or a manco. And, and typically it will be a, a, a minimum fee with a sliding scale of basis points charge, which is included in the total expense ratio of, of, of the fund. Uh, very difficult to get to any more specific because you know, a pricing for a P firm or a property fund or a hedge fund would be very different. There are but, some that do fix, have a fixed fee model. There is a few that do that, that don't do, do a percentage of AUM. In Mancos? Yeah. Yeah, very few. And, uh, but I would say that, uh, I, th I can think actually of one, but uh, 
it's it's it, it, I wouldn't say it's the industry kind of norm. I would say you know the basis points charges is, and as you grow as a business, the basis point charge, considering the the regulatory reporting, the liabilities that you take on a on a product, is a logical one to uh, to have and agree. We 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 earn much less than a than a fund manager. Uh, and 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 it's 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 some ways you know maybe we should get paid more because we do more <laughs> and more you know <laughs> but right now i would agree a, a portfolio manager i wouldn't say earns 40 times more because i mean we would make literally no money but you know we 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 do get paid much more modest fees than a fund manager so we we can have a debate on who gets paid in the too much or too little. All right. Timothy, do you uh, want to take that one on the dichotomy between um, the... Uh, you actually did touch upon this somewhat in your earlier comments, but do you want to respond to that person who asked the yeah, question? Uh, sure. But I don't... Th I don't think there is a dichotomy between portfolio managers and... Uh, can be considered as such, but look, it's either you're regulated or not. And... The question about fees uh, for the portfolio manager is not a question if you're regulated. And it's true that if you are regulated and the manco has the possibility to, de to delegate the portfolio management, you have to have your own organization, you have to have your own risk management, and you have to be able to demonstrate that you're capable to um, deploy the strategy that, um, that you want to operate into the fund. Um, it's probably a an added complication because you need to have the fund being or not regulated. So one regulator, you need to have the portfolio management to be regulated. It's organization, it's complications. You need to, uh, to have the manco being regulated again, a complexity. So each of the player today have to have its own organization and to have its own regulation. The only model where you don't have to have that is when you're applying the advisory model, um, which does not require you to have your own uh, organization or a big organization, uh, but you, are, uh, you, you, you stay plugged somehow on the organi organization of uh, the Manco, which then uh, has to afford the, the different complexities and the different rules that uh, are applicable from the, from the different uh, regulators. So probably if you have uh, the, 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 the different regulators, it can become a complexity as such. Now it's, it's also the question of, uh, and, and that's part of uh, one of the other questions on the asset center management to be able to have your own manco and being able to service um, to service your own fund yourself with your own company. I think there are, there are two questions out of, the, out of this. Do you want to manage that, uh, manage that and do, do you want to manage the people that are going to manage that? Because it's not only a question of cost, it's a question of time. The more people you have, the more you need to manage them. And uh, you, the, the, the more uh, procedures and regulatory burden you have, the more you have to manage it. So um, that's the question of whether you want to take time to manage that compared to uh, can you afford to that? And that really depends from one company to another, from one strategy to another. You know, I see people managing assets for... Uh, uh, as a portfolio management for 20 bips, I see other managing assets for uh, 250 bips. That really depends on the um, on the strategy and the type of uh, type of investors. Luke, perhaps I can throw this one at you. I mean, do you think it's healthy to have a situation where um, whether you, whether you agree with the sentence or not, I don't know. Uh, no investor I know of really knows anything about what happens at the main cap. They only really care about the portfolio management team. Uh, if we ever get into a real shocking bear market, they might get to find out a bit more about what goes on. You know, when there was the business with um, uh, uh, Link and what's his name already forgotten? Um, uh, uh, was the, the, Woodford. Okay. Woodford, thank you. So when things go wrong, then the things come up. But mostly people uh, don't really know. Is that a good thing or not? But I, I, I think that's a, a, fair, a fairly, fairly common and, and glib statement. Yeah. It's only when things go wrong that people care. 
But it doesn't mean to say that investors on the outset don't take an interest uh, uh, and make uh, you know, informed inquiries as to who are the providers behind it, you know, who are the, the mancos, you know, and how it's all done. Um, but, uh, but I think that's a, you know, that, that sort of statement, you know, that inv invest investors don't care uh, you know, only until it goes wrong is, is, is it's been around for a long, long time. So, you know, and, and those that uh, have gone through deep dive operational due diligence from, from the bigger, uh, bigger investment houses, I'm sure, you know, and, and, have, and have received an allocation, have probably gone through an awful lot to, to, get, to get that allocation in, uh, because it's probably been quite, quite a rigorous process. Um, but, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's, all, there's always a, a few gaps um, and, and, and th things can happen to which uh, can, can be somewhat um, above and beyond what you would have originally, originally had, had thought. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the interesting points we haven't quite touched upon a bit further was, and I know Simon, you and I touched upon it, was the, the you know, when does the private equity run it, money run out for the, the, the fund admin and, and, and the manco and who, who's, who's then left bit holding the baby to that? And what does that then look like for all the consolidated uh, mancos? Um, you know, is that... Is that uh, an, an investor red herring to, to, or a red flag, should I say, to, to look out for? I think it's quite a, an interesting point we haven't yet touched upon. Or do, do you still look for independent mancos? But I think to Cyril's point earlier on, the bigger are getting a lot bigger. The specialist ones out there for, for, for niche vehicles, but the, the smaller, medium size, I don't think will be there you know, going forward. The one thing that no one's answered the question that somebody put about what size do you need? What's the, uh, it, maybe it, it varies a bit by fund strategy, but what is the size that- I think- more, more, By yourself or being on a third party platform? More than size, Simon, it's what's your pain threshold and your, and, and, and your budget to, to set up a new entity in a new jurisdiction. And, 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 and so if you look at, you know, the, who uses Mancos, extremely large global asset managers use Mancos, like they use third, a fund. Third, you, mean, you mean third party Mancos? Third party Mancos, because they see it as the same equivalent of a fund admin, an auditor, you know, it, these are kind of ecosystem and really businesses. Control, but they've, they've got to give up a bit of a control. To make you the, the part, the, their partner. Yes, but the, the, the reality is is that in in all these functions, you give control to 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 somebody. Uh, that, ha that however, the investment management function, the strategy, and for the most part, the asset raising and the relationship with the investors is still stays with the investment manager. So these are the core components that. The fund manager should be caring about two things, making money for its investors and, and keeping them happy. Right. Uh, because... Simon, I, I would query with the idea that the manager is giving up control. Effectively, what they're doing is they're getting assets under a slightly different mandate. Um, and the purpose of the manco is to ensure that the fund manager does what they say. I mean, investment management in Europe is no longer just allocation of assets. There's a whole range of things which gives the investors a certain amount of security. It's not the case of you just pick a fund manager. You pick a fund manager, but the back of your head, there's a, and he's not going to steal my money, or he, she is not going to steal my money. He, she's not going to do something which they didn't say they're going to do with it. And that's the role of the manco. I mean, we may not like talking about Woodford, but it is actually remarkable that in, you know, since the uses were set up, that's one of the few that actually stick out is where the whole, the whole thing went rather lamentably sideways. Um, and that is to the that is to the credit of the usits. You're not telling fund managers what to do. You're telling them if you want the money, this is what you got to do to do it. And it's not a huge imposition when you look at forty act funds. Um, so I, I think it's more of a case of control. You're not giving up, but what you are getting is external monitoring to ensure you do what you say you're going to do. We've got seconds left. I'm going to come back to you straight with that, Peter. But uh, as for perhaps the last comment is that. Uh, We've been on a phenomenal bull run since 2008. 
uh, we may not be on a phenomenal bull run for another, you know, several years yet. You know, there could be a moment where we get another um, market crash situation. Are you still pretty sanguine in that situation for the, what you've just been talking about? Sanguine? It's my job to be not sanguine. Sorry. No, I'm never sanguine. I'm not All sanguine right. now. All right. <laughs> if All you're right. sanguine, you're in the wrong business. All right. I think you managed to you know, sidestep that like a brilliant Leinster winger perfectly, that question. Well done, uh, Miss, Miss, Mr. Or oh, Dr. Cripwell, I should say. Well, listen, thank you all very much indeed for doing this. Thank you for those of you who are out there. There is going to be, I didn't mention this at the beginning, there's going to be a recording of this going up, which we're going to flag heavily with we, when we put our Manco guide out. We've just found a formula where we get quite a lot more audience from the recording, so people can watch this particular thing as they eat their Christmas turkey or whenever they want to do it over the course of the next few weeks. Um, and that uh, brings up the audience quite nicely, um, uh, as I say. So have a very good, very good qu a Christmas to you all. Thank you again for joining us and uh, have a good lunch or one or two of you in the States, have a good breakfast. See you the next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.